Well, I'm a full-time mediator and a commercial mediator and trainer, and I suppose I got to that via a very sort of meandering kind of route. As I set out to be a lawyer, I set out. Actually, I was destined for in-house counsel in some great European global organisation um, because when I went to university, that was the beginning of the European Union and that was what we were looking towards is the expansion of our opportunities and, and, and that's what I set out to do. Um, however, somewhere along the way I got really captivated by business and uh, the ability to innovate and making things happen and solving problems because I'm a fixer really, that's my nature and that doesn't sit terribly well with being a mediator because we're not supposed to fix things. But I think you have to start being a fixer to understand what it is you are doing when you're mediating. So it's, it's been helpful. And I've used my law um, knowledge all my career but in a very background capacity. So I have drawn on it and I've used it to leverage my curiosity about how do we get around this? How do we um, create a contract here which doesn't break any laws, but is, is moving things on, is innovative? Um, because we, being innovative means pushing the boundaries and doing something which hasn't been done before. And you're always a little bit aware of the consequences of doing that. So that's, uh, I absolutely love what I do. Um, and I particularly love the teaching because that is the way in which I learn more, paradoxically. So if I'm not learning more when I'm teaching than what I teach, um, it's, not, it's not been a good job for me. Um, so bringing the practice of mediation into the teaching and taking what I learn in the teaching about the context in which my students are going to work and bringing that back into my mediation, my international experience, cross-cultural, and I don't mean that internationally, I mean different business cultures. Bringing that into my mediation is just a, um, a sort of ever-evolving spiral of experience and it suits me. Um, I'm a great believer that um, you, you need to do and be the mediator before you can really teach uh, that because people are always asking you, well Amanda, what do you do if? What do you do if? And you can't respond from a place of academic knowledge. You, you have to respond from a place of, you know, I've been there or I've been somewhere quite close. Um, so I, I started mediating before I trained as a mediator. That was my style of negotiation. And um, I sat down one day when there was a kind of hiatus in my life and thought, well, what do I do next? And I designed a matrix for myself of what I was good at, um, what I liked doing, and uh, what po the possibilities were. And I remember sitting there at three o'clock filling out this matrix and the insights that came from discerning between what I was good at and what I liked doing was very, very important to me because I was good at quite a lot of things I didn't like doing. Um, and and the, that, uh, that time allowed me to choose something. So I, I came up with this thing which was like a, a negotiator, um, harmonizer, um, opportunity bringer, and there wasn't a profession as far as I knew that what was that, and I wanted to be professional. So I went looking, and um, I remember a call to an arbitrator who was, had an office near where I lived, and I said to him, you don't know me, and this is going to seem like a very strange question, but could I just ask you to spend 10 minutes telling me about what it is you do? because I think I'd like to do it. And he started telling me, and I thought, no, I don't, that's not me. And, and I was responding to him, he said, you don't want to be an arbitrator, you want to be a mediator. And as soon as I heard that word, I got goosebumps. That was it, I knew that was it. I 
went and I went and trained. And after my training, I walked out of that training and I didn't do anything else. So I went and found training. It was, there wasn't very much of it about at that time. It took me a long time to decide to do it. Um, I did it and I walked out of that training and I never done anything else since. Now that's either mad or inspired. Because it was very tough in those days. Though nobody knew what it was. You know, they thought it was meditation. They even spelt it wrong in the telephone directory. It was under alternative therapies. And, uh, and I just thought, well, never mind about the name. You know, I could spend my life trying to educate people about what mediation means. I'm just going to do it. And I did it under any guise. I, I did it in corporations, small businesses, family businesses. And uh, I, my line was, you know, they said, well, what, where do we put you? You know, where do we put you? And I said, well, where, where's the line on the budget? What have you got on your budget? You've got communication. Don't worry, I, I call it communication, I don't mind. And just do it. And that's been my motto, just do it. I came from an entrepreneurial family, so I wasn't scared of being self-employed. That was normal for my family. Um, I think once I got this idea of not hanging on the name, I think that was the big opener for me, call it whatever, you know? Just be in the right place with the right people doing this thing. And, and if they want to call it mediation, fine by me. If they want to call it communication, PR, whatever. So, one, for, for example, one of the mm, really great uh, cases that I did was with a huge global manufacturer um, who had massive problems with one of their big brands. It was just sort of diving. And um, they asked me if I could sort of help with this. And I discovered that the, the sales and marketing teams were just at war with each other. You know, Italy wasn't talking to France, wasn't talking to Germany, wasn't talking to America. I mean, it was just awful. And there was a real competitiveness that was destructive. And my mediation was about re reconciling the conflict between all these sales teams. And I did that through, actually, photography and writing, storytelling. And by creating the stories and great images of what their products were producing and getting those published in widely in magazines and um, there, wasn't, there weren't blogs or anything like that in those days. So, you know, it was magazines. They, they started getting competitive about who could get the best project, who, you know, how would they going to beat, you know, the fantastic toll uh, bridge that had been built in France and that gave me a great uh, validation of how important storytelling and imagery are to inspiring people to understanding you know what's possible you know what's so what's over the high what's over the eye line you know um, and that would have been well uh, a good 30 years ago. No, no, sorry, 20 years ago. A good 20 years ago. And it was quite novel then to use that sort of approach. But they became very strong. And they then started sharing their um, knowledge with each other. And that's another great thing about what we do, both as a mediator and as a teacher. I share my knowledge with people. I share my experience and they take of it what they want to, and they don't use the bits that aren't relevant for them. Um, and getting people to share information is a principal role of a mediator. How do I, as a mediator, build enough trust between these people who may despise each other, may never want to see each other again? How do I get enough trust that they will actually share information that's going to get them both where they want to be. So there's a very nice synergy there. Um, and I think cross um, skills, you know, cross-pollination of skills is what we need 
in every profession these days. We need something of everything in order to be effective. I think there are very, very, very few cases where mediation doesn't have a role to play. And the reason why I say that is that if you have small claims where there's a small, very small amount of money, then you're not talking about big shifts in who wants what. You're talking about really very small shifts. And the compensation of that is a change in behaviour, a change in approach. And that comes from a better understanding. So mediation has a, a massive role to play in smaller cases. In bigger cases, the complexity and the dependency and the interdependency of organisations in our global business world is so important that even if you only use mediation to narrow the issues or get a better understanding of some complex issues, that can have a profound effect on where that dispute ends up and how successful the resolution is. So I'm a great believer in the skills being used at every stage of a dispute, however mature it is. Some people might say, well, you can't mediate a mandar until you really know the case and every, all the work's been done. No, I don't believe that. And I've used it in times when people have been going off in a completely different direction and the mediation process and you know, the skills used has brought people back to realise that's not where we want to go. That's where we want to go. Um, would you like an ex a brief example? There was a very, very successful printing company. It was also a family business. And they, I, I'd worked with them on something very particular, which was actually legislation, drafting some legislation and printing that legislation for a particular sector. And the managing director said, Amanda, we want to pitch for this um, uh, business. Uh, will you help us? So I said, well, yes, I will. I said, the only thing is, is that we need to have a meeting to find out if you really want this business. And he said, well, of course we want the business. And I said, maybe you don't. That, you know, almost sort of like, trust me, this is something you need to do in order to know exactly what it is you want. Well, we had that meeting and it was such an amazing meeting. It was a cross-discipline meeting and he was also managing director right down to the guys who did the job, right? So it was really broad and deep, yeah. And they were a bit nervous about opening up in front of their managing director. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we did a day's work. And at the end of that day, the managing director had had the courage to say he didn't like his job and he wanted to go and do something else. Not out of the company, he just wanted to focus on the digital media, which was starting to be very important at that time. The younger members of staff had the courage to turn around and say, well, that's a really good idea because we don't think you're very good at what you're doing at the moment. Now, this could only happen in the sort of mediated environment that we talk about. And so that was sorted, and they realised that actually, yes, they would like this business, but it would mean they would have to close their core business. Core business. And they could never, in my opinion, have conceived of closing their core business just from a meeting, a general business meeting. We, it needed the mediation process to get better. So, at the end of that, the following day, we spent 20 minutes, we put the presentation together, they went in the afternoon, 20 minutes to put the presentation, four pictures and four questions, that was all. They went to give the pitch to this very big company and they came away uh, with very positive vibes and the telephone call the next day with a quarter of a million pounds of the business in the bag. Why? Because they were absolutely clear what they could do, how they were going to do it, what they needed to do it, and who was going to lead it. And that wouldn't have happened without the mediation the day before.
I think a good mediator with skills can mediate anything and I think you can do a better job if you have some knowledge of the sector, particularly the language. I think that's part of trust and rapport. I don't think it actually reflects on whether you can mediate or not, but I think that affects the perception of the people you are you know, serving. So if you're working in the banking sector, yeah, I think you need to know a bit about what's going on. I don't think you need to be an expert. I certainly don't think you need to be an expert in banking law, because generally that is something which plays a very it plays a role, but a small role in terms of what we do. So language, understanding of the sector, and appreciating the challenges that the people in front of you have. I think those are more important. The regulation and management and supervision of mediators is a very is a topic that's really close to my heart and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and studying the ways in which we do it in professions at the moment and my thoughts on how we do it at the moment is it's a bit bolting the door after the closing the door after the horse has bolted you are the regulation is to give the customers comfort Fair enough, we want them to have comfort, but it's about punishing people um, when they've done wrong. And that has devastating effects on a professional. So two principles for me, those who are going to do it badly are always going to do it badly. Right? So you need to have a mechanism by which you can spot them, give them a chance and then kick them out. Actually, I'm pretty ruthless in that. I'm not one of these people who says, oh, come on, anybody, 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 right? I, I think there is a certain amount of self-selection, which has worked very well in the mediation profession so far, right? Self-selection, the right people come. When it's pushed by, a, uh, by legislation or pushed by policy, then you start to get people coming because they think it's another way to add income. And then you maybe don't get the same sort of self-selection. That's probably when you need to have a little bit of a gate to let people come through. And I think that gate is its a pretty heavy commitment to the training because it's at least five days. I wish it were more, but it's at least five days. Um, and if people don't attend the whole course, shh, no, you know, uh, it, you come and you do it. So that's one way of sort of starting in the selection. The quality of training, um, how do you judge that? Hmm. You know, if people are enjoying the training, is that effective training? Probably not. And I think a lot of people who train are able to entertain. But I'm not sure that a lot of people are actually really understanding the process of embedding the learning so that it becomes part of the professional and that they do it rather than talk about it. So how do we deal with that? And I think my answer is that as there should be a level of supervision and there is a balance between the supervision and self-regulation. There's some wonderful work out there at the moment about how important it is to develop the skills to self-regulate your own uh, performance. <clears throat> that doesn't mean to say you're left to your own devices and you say, I'm wonderful, I've got somebody in my orbit at the moment who has convinced himself he's absolutely the best, and he isn't. But, so there's this gap between self-perception and performance. But I think a combination between teaching people the skills of reflective practice, notes, journals, having conversations with trusted colleagues who are able to say, do you know what, that doesn't sound like the right sort of thing. So those uh, peer uh, conversations, um, which are based on trust. And then I think a certain amount of ad hoc uh, observation of mediation mediator so in my supervisory world in my regulated world 
um, as a mediator, you would have to sign up to somebody um, saying, okay, on this mediation, I I'm going to come along as your observer and see how the mediation is conducted and then have a conversation after that. So that, that takes a bit of effort, but you know what? It's going to be a lot less effort and a lot less expensive than a fancy um, regulation system with phenomenal legal fees for defending and all the rest of it. I think that a dispute panel or you know, a panel of mediators should have a very good basic training, they should. Um, and anything that is extra and offered and incorporated above a standard, well in Europe it would be 40 hours, uh, to me demonstrates that the trainers have, you know, they're giving a lot. But people should commit to good CPD, which is not about mediation, continuous professional development, because actually there's very little in that regard. You can go on advanced mediation courses, etc. but some of the topics that support mediation, I think that work and study in those areas, the areas of psychology, for example, the psychology of decision making, the vast amount there that's very useful to mediators in understanding how to get people in the right place. So, continuous professional development. Now, in the UK, 16 hours of CPD in two years, I don't think that's enough at all. Um, I think a combination of face-to-face um, -face lectures, uh, peer review, uh, a reading, and maybe sort of discussion groups around a book. You know, it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be a long time, just an hour or so. Um, and these, these slight commitment to allowing somebody to come in and watch you as you're mediating and then have that uh, proper feedback. That to me is going to be a safer management of risk, because we're talking about risk here. We're talking about somebody doing something really bad and it reflecting on everybody. Uh, my own approach to my own regulation, because I'm not regulated by anybody, we don't have mediation, mediator regulation in the UK yet, but I'm on the Civil Mediation Council um, as an elected board member for individual mediators, and we are, <coughs> excuse me, we are as a, uh, a board discussing this very thing. The difficulty is that the standards tend to come down to minimum standards and I understand that. I understand that you want to say to the public, if you use these mediators, they have this minimum standard. Unfortunately, that lowers the standards. When there are no standards, Trainers are pitching higher and higher because there's, there's nothing, you're not being told. So you're actually going to get better training when there are no standards. And that's a real truth for me, you know, but I totally accept that the majority of people out there think that minimum standards is going to do it. I know it won't. And so the mediators who train with me, they have to sign up to my form of uh, regulation. I think on balance, the court mandated, um, because I think that represents a better partnership between everybody that's involved. So the judiciary are well informed and educated and they look at a case and they sort of go right well you know because the law says that's the first port of call or you need to try it and um, so the understanding of the sort of direction on one level 
for some cases. And for some other types of cases where there are may maybe large numbers of them, that they are used as a means of saying, right, well, you have to go through this mediation process. The challenge, I think, for people is, is that in telling the public you must do this, it is human nature to spend a lot of effort trying not to do it, because that's what we do as human beings. As soon as somebody tells us we've got to do something, we spend all our energy on trying not to do it. And there's a bit of a hiatus, I think, uh, 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 when people are saying, well, why do I have to do this? And I thought mediation was voluntary. Yes, mediation is voluntary because the settlement that you arrive at is voluntary and it isn't binding until you sign it. So that's volu still voluntary. And people's access to the court is still uh, preserved as a, as a right of access. Why do I not say court annexed? Um, I think that's because that prescribes a in-house team of mediators and without naming areas uh, where this has been tried it hasn't worked terribly well. Um, it's, I think the freedom to choose the mediator that you want is an essential part of the trust building process that it should be somebody who isn't put, put on you, you know, foisted on you, that you're actually, because that's part of the commitment process. Two people agreeing, that's the first agreement. That actually sometimes takes a bit of a tussle, but we get better at that. Um, but the first agreement is who's going to be our mediator. And that's a very important psychological step to participating in the process. So that's why I prefer the, court, the uh, mandated mediation as opposed to court annexed. I can see the virtues in both, but you ask me which I prefer. One of the things I would really like to see here and elsewhere uh, is a much earlier introduction for law students uh, to, you know, real mediation. Um, to have a better understanding because I think that the practice of law is evolving so fast at the moment and the new generation of young lawyers excite me because they are um, eager and, and they're looking forward to this fabulous career um, but I've sort of slightly got a little bit of a, a desire to get a broader appreciation of dispute resolution so that it isn't it's only this way because I did this at law school and this is what I'm supposed to be and this is what I do because I think as lawyers we all practicing non-practicing whatever but you know if you're there you're there you really need to have a greater appreciation of what mediation is as part of the dispute resolution process because it's not alternative, it is dispute resolution.